Good afternoon. My name is Ram. Um, all of you can hear me at the back, right? So you don't need a mic and all that. I think my voice is okay. Um, so first of all, thank you. And please continue eating. <laughs> no, continue eating. Enjoy. Uh, now, I'm a life member of MDIS. Uh, I was, I studied through MDIS. And today I thought I should use this opportunity to actually at least pay forward. When I was with MDIS, uh, there were many occasions where industry specialists used to come along, share with us ideas, give us uh, a lot of insights into how things work in the outside world. And I thought I'd do the same. So uh, I spent about, just a brief about myself, I spent, uh, I did my MBA and postgraduate qualifications from MDIS to the University of East London. And then I went into the corporate world and spent about 40 years in the corporate world. Uh, and after that, I, being a Singaporean, following the government's philosophy, I went, did continuous learning, and I relearned and went into counseling at the age of 16. So I ended up as a counselor. And as a counselor, you know, we, we get a chance to meet with a variety of people with a, a variety of problems, and we are all good people with good problems. It's just that how easy or difficult is it to handle it. And what I found interesting was that in Singapore, particularly, uh, we had a lot of emphasis being given to no smoking. And we also had a lot of emphasis to the place you all went today, CNB, drugs. However, even though alcohol is a drug, it never appeared anywhere. Right? And if you turn the papers, you look at the newspapers every day, you find that almost on a daily basis, you find people. So, I found that this, this, this thing was like a lacuna, right? We were not addressing alcohol at all. <coughs> Yet, if you open the newspapers on any one particular day, there is a crime being committed because of somebody who has been intoxicated and indulged in alcohol to the point that they did not know what they were doing. So you find eight, ten people get mol uh, going out molesting people, getting charged for it. You got somebody punching a cabbie or punching a policeman. So every day you see this. But I was puzzled that when I went to the National Library, I could not find a single book in Singapore written by a Singaporean that actually talked about the issues of alcohol. And not so much about the issues of alcohol because uh, Probably a lot of people know that they have problems with alcohol, but actually, what do you do about it? You know, once you are into it, what do you do about it? So I said, okay, rather than uh, anyone else, let me try doing. So that ended me on a, uh, started me on a journey to write a book, and, and that's the book that at the end of this session I would like to share with you all. Now, alcohol started off by being his friend. At the end, okay, at the end of it, it was actually a thief. He stole everything from him. He became a, almost a beggar. So this is the true story of anyone who passes into the framework of alcoholism. And why, as you as psychology students, I wanted to specially come and share this with you, was that you will be meeting such people in your life. You will be coming across such situations in your life. Be prepared. First of all, for yourself, be careful about this drug. Alcohol is a drug ethanol, as you all know. And you need to be careful. It's as, as dangerous, if not more, than any of the other illegal drugs like cocaine or heroin or whatever. Every day, my friend and I, Cheong and I, we counsel people with drugs. 
and you listen to them. And when we, you listen to their story, we understand that actually they first started off with alcohol. Actually, they started with cigarettes, then they put to alcohol, and then they put to drugs. Because they want to chase the intoxication. They, it wants more and more. So alcohol can be your friend, and then it can turn out to be a thief. Now, your attitude to alcohol can be uh, begin from anywhere. Anyone can have an attitude towards alcohol, and it can come from it can come from persuasion of friends. It can come because of your own experience, because you you drank it for yourself. Uh, it can come off because uh, you know you saw on the telly or you watched things, and you know you can get a multitude of ways of getting a habit about alcohol. The drivers can be plenty. The drivers can be that you know you see you see people being very successful drinking and you think that that's that's the way to go so there can be a multitude of drivers that people can engage in alcohol the drinks that you can start with can be also quite different some people never actually start with beer they actually start with wine so it can be anywhere okay you can take gin wine beer whiskey brandy whatever so people can start anywhere. They can, they can get that experience. We sometimes have a wrong notion that only a certain type of people actually take alcohol. You know, after the Little India riots in Singapore, a lot of people in Singapore had a picture that it was this Indian construction or laborers or whatever, they are the people who are actually alcoholics. Sorry, it's totally wrong. Alcohol does not discriminate. Alcohol does not discriminate. Some of the richest, the most intelligent, the most disciplined, the most uh, hardworking people are also functional alcoholics. They may not accept it, they are there. So please remember that alcohol does not dis discriminate. There is no stereotype. Any age, any gender, any academic social status, any ethnicity, alcohol can still strike you. It has no respect for you. Once you get the euphoria of alcohol, you want to chase it. So it's all about euphoria. It's all about the fun and the enjoyment. And it hits you in a very complex way. Is such a disease that you are the only person who will not realize that you are an alcoholic. Everyone around you will know that you are an alcoholic. Your behavior, your actions, everything will be of an alcoholic. You will not realize that you are an alcoholic. All right? So it's a very complex disease. It's a brain disease, right? It's a friend. The friendship comes could come for any of those reasons. You know, it could be because you, some people take alcohol, they say, oh, you take alcohol, you know, when you fall sick, you know, you take alcohol, you got a bit of a cold, you take alcohol, you, you're all right. So alcohol is a medicine. Alcohol can be something for glamour, you know, you go, you go high functions, you know, drink expensive. If I drink expensive wine, expensive liquor, I will never be an alcoholic. So the motives, the motives behind it are quite uh, interesting. You could have any motive. You want to be seen as somebody important. You want to be seen as somebody part of a social group. You want to be seen as somebody who, uh, you know, uh, is a party goer. So it could be any motives. The intoxication drives you. Your tolerance builds up. You build up your tolerance. Once your tolerance builds up, the compulsion comes in. People think that, you know, you, you find some people tell you, oh, I, you know, I can take a five, six beers. I, I don't have a problem. I will, I will never get a hangover or I will never get intoxicated. Not true. It's a tolerance that is building up. How do they know that they are intoxicated? 
because they can't know it for themselves, you know. The liquor is already affecting them. People can observe the visible signs. You cannot. People can. When you start realizing it is when you start getting humiliated. It's a thief. From a friend, it takes a thief. So look at what it will do to you. First, it will take away your time. You know, once you are indulging in alcohol, you will spend a lot of time drinking. You will find every moment drinking. You will spend money, a lot of money. Your health will go, start going bonkers because of your drinking. Your career will suffer. Your family, your good friends, your reputation, your integrity, your own. Finally, the worst thing, very, very good people, very, very disciplined people, suddenly start becoming dishonest. Your honesty suffers. And once your honesty suffers, you are doomed. So when people suddenly get this um, knock on their head, they go to the counselor, they go to the doctor, they, are, they collapse or whatever, and they suddenly get a knock on their head. Then what they do is the first thing they try to do is to abstain. They try to stop drinking. Thing is, it doesn't solve the problem. All of you, please remember this. If somebody is in an addiction and that person tries to stop that addiction all of a sudden, that can be very disastrous. It needs to be managed. It needs a doctor, it needs a counselor, it needs to be managed. Otherwise, you get something which is called a deprivation effect. You will get insomnia, you will get depression, you will get anxiety, you get all those things coming through. And if, you, if a doctor is not managing it, a counselor is not helping you to look through your issues, you can really get into a lot of problems. You enter into a depression. If you try to have a solo fight, you enter into a depression, you will then relapse. And the risk of relapse in any form of addiction, including alcoholism, is that you then become worse than the original state. So if you're originally drinking four cans of beer, this time now you relapse, you will start drinking six to eight cans because it will pick up from wherever you left before. You become despondent. So once people relapse, many times, so in our experience, when people relapse, they actually give up on themselves. They think they, can't, they are hopeless. They cannot do it. They give up. They become despondent. And finally, this is where they are in the addiction trap. What can be done about it? You can't, first of all, please remember, if you come across anybody with addiction, try to encourage them, tell them that they cannot ever do it alone. Forget about it. Can't do it alone. They have to, first of all, get back their honesty from being a very dishonest person, person who doesn't want to agree that they have got a problem. They have to first accept that they got a problem. And to be honest, they need to seek help. They need a village to help them to recover. Getting into the problem was you alone. Getting out of it, you need 10 people to help you, and I'll tell you why. You need persistence. Persistence, earlier, it was your persistence to take the drink. Now it's your persistence not to take the drink. Okay? And you need to change your lifestyle. You cannot ever go back to the original lifestyle that you had. You cannot even take a drink once again because you will have a problem. You need, you need to rewire your brain, okay? From the stage where it has already been messed up because of alcoholism, you need to rewire. You need all these people to help you. You need a village for recovery. You need a village to support you. You can't do it by yourself. Lifestyle needs to change. You need to find a new sense of meaning. Your whole preoccupation was alcohol. Now you have to tell yourself, what am I going to do next? 
like it or not, if you if you are a religious person, you need to go back to your religion and have faith and have humility, have gratefulness, you know, seek forgiveness because you you in your in your drunken state you would have done horrible things. You need to do that. You need to build back your physical health, emotion, your relationships. All your relationships have, would have gone haywire. You have fought with your friends, you have fought with your bosses, you have fought with people, right? And finally, you need to rebuild back, redo back your mental health. In my book, I actually came up with an acronym. I call it the SPERM model. Okay? It's, a, it's just a catchy, catchy acronym. It's a catchy acronym that I, I we call it the sperm model. Why, why did I select this? Firstly, you will never ever forget it. Okay? So I, I, I came up with this acronym. Um, the second thing is, sperm gives life, new life. You need a new life. You cannot continue your whole life. This is where I like to end this short talk with you. I just wanted to introduce you to the subject and tell you about alcoholism and tell you about this recovery. Now, you have a bit of time. I'm free to take any questions you want. Please ask me anything that you want. Yes, please. Uh, sir, um, like, unless you are the one drinking, I guess you'll have um, an idea of what excessive would be, but for, for us, if we were just observed, what would you say would be excessive? Um, so, so, very simple, we just go by the health guidelines. Okay. The health guidelines says two cans of beer, right. anything more than two cans of beer is excessive. And that's in one drinking session? In one drinking session. Okay. And what is usually recommended is that and, and nobody ever follows it. Huh? What's usually recommended? So remember what I told you about one can of beer, how long does it take? An hour. An hour. Yeah. For your that, the process. So would you, uh, have you ever come across anybody taking one can of no. beer drinking over one hour? Right. So if you ask me the recommended status, that's the recommended status, right? Um, and similarly, I mean, it goes by ounces of beer, you know, it's five ounces of beer. So. I think um, if you look up at the health promotion board, there are recommendations, you know, for uh, wine, for beer, and so forth. Um, All right, so you can look that up, but they are very minimal. Nobody follows that, <laughs> and that's the problem. Okay. Any other question? Yes, please. Um, how do you know if you're addicted to alcohol? Is it like, is there a euphoria to it? Um, how do you know? Very interesting question, very difficult question to answer. <laughs> because the person who is addicted to alcohol, he himself actually would not, nobody, nobody in their sane mind really would want to be dishonest, want to cheat, want to do all the things that an alcoholic does. So, so an alcoholic, if he, the day he realizes he's an alcoholic, wow, life change. He has to get sobriety first. He has to be helped to get off alcohol first, get a clear mind, mm -hmm. and that's the time the pointers of what he has done, you know, things that he has done, because he has to see himself and visualize what has he done, and then ask himself, is, would I have done it if I was in my normal state? And that's how a person recognizes that he is not alcohol. It's tough, it's difficult. It's with any drugs, by the way. If a drug addict knows what it is like to be a drug addict, he will never be a drug addict. I am a teetotaler. I don't drink. But I decided to talk on this subject, write on this subject, and champion this subject because I have come across so many. You can people see like the you. severity of alcohol. No need to go far. You open the papers, newspapers, 
over the past few days, you can see for yourself what was the severity of alcohol in Singapore. The thing is because it's a legal drug, it's a social drug, it's a legal drug, so it's allowed for. There are rules that are laid down by the government. Uh, those above 18 can drink. They can only drink in certain hours. You should not drink up to that. People should not be selling drinks to people who are underage and all that. But does that work? See young kids buying and drinking all over the place. You go to Boat Key and you see people puking all over the place, right? <laughs> So, yeah, so I'm not George. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Otherwise, I thank you very much for all your attention. Uh, I have uh, brought a copy of my book for all of you. Uh, this is my uh, gratitude, my payback to MDIS. Uh, and I want you to have a copy of this book. Um, I, if you find this book worthwhile. Uh, the, the, this book is sold in the bookstores for $22.90. For you, what I would like you to do is that if you read the book, feel happy about it, go to, go to whichever charity of your choice, whichever religious organization of your choice, and give them a donation of whatever you feel for the book. I'll be very blessed, all right? Thank you. Thank you.